Uh, it's my first time in Waterloo, uh, and it is an honor to be here. It's such a pleasure. So uh, as Howard alluded to, I, I am born and raised in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and uh, it's actually very, very similar to my experience of coming first to Toronto and then to uh, Waterloo. In fact, my uh, home university looks pretty much exactly like the University of Waterloo when I walked around outside. And also, we have snow in April occasionally in Denmark. So uh, it, it's, it's really a, a somewhat surreal to be here, um, especially because I was listening to uh, the sessions earlier today where there was uh, several very relevant topics. And uh, it's interesting how Northern Europe is actually very similar to Canada in the types of challenges in terms of startups, in terms of innovation, in terms of the role of government, uh, and, and many of the other challenges that were discussed. So, uh, so in that sense, it was, it was interesting. I think before I, I, uh, I start giving you an insight into the world I'm in, I want to just briefly comment on a couple of things from uh, earlier today. And I think the first thing I, I want to comment on is, uh, is Susan's presentation uh, about the role of uh, women in tech. Because uh, I have a female co-founder, Rebecca Wang. Um, we have, we're about 18 people in, in my company. We're from uh, 10 different countries, but it's about half and half uh, men and women. And that's not a deliberate policy. It just so happened that those were the best candidates that we hired. So uh, I'm not in any way a fan of any kind of, kind of quotas or, or uh, expectations in terms of, of female participation in startups, but there is no doubt that there is a very significant talent opportunity uh, out there. And uh, the most frequent reason I hear from companies, from, from not just startups, but also other organizations, about why they don't have more women uh, involved in, in, in tech is that we take the best candidates, and those are the ones that applied. But imagine, let's say that you are a big uh, Canadian tech company. You have operations all over the country. Let's imagine that your candidate pool almost exclusively had candidates from the Western provinces. I assure you, you would take a very close look at your branding, at your messaging, uh, at your HR people, at everything you do in order to attract your, your candidates. Uh, and, uh, and I think we need to, to look at not just women, but many other types of, of uh, I wouldn't call them minorities, but just underrepresented uh, uh, sectors of the tech world. So uh, it's just an encouragement to, to be sure you look at your own startups and your own organizations very closely if you are not attracting the right candidates. Uh, and if you don't hire the good ones, I will hire the good ones. <laughs> so um, the, other, the other comment uh, is, I guess, to the, the role of government, because Howard mentioned Startup Chile. And indeed, I, I'll tell you a little bit about how that works. And that is one of the, unfortunately, very few government programs that actually work in terms of creating startups. The vast majority of government programs do not create startups. They may help you create more uh, small businesses. They may help uh, improve in kind of framework conditions, uh, uh, but really startups are created by entrepreneurs. So today I'm gonna talk predominantly to the, to the entrepreneurs out there. It's you guys are the ones that are creating the next business environment in Canada. So don't rely on government or anybody else to create uh, startups for you. At best, they're going to help you remove a few barriers. That would be great, but really, you are the ones that have to go and do this. Um, and the good thing is, the world is changing in your favor. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the world that I'm in. So uh, I, I, I call this the global startup revolution, and I feel like in some ways, myself and the team at Unoodle and many others are in the trenches of the global startup revolution. Uh, so things are changing. And I know that sounds like uh, a cliche by now, but uh, we're picking it up in the data, and I'll, I'll share some of that in, the, in a minute. But the life for a startup is just fundamentally different today than it was just three years ago, and very different from, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and there are a couple of drivers that I just want to make sure that everyone kind of understands that, that, that are really key to, to how you can look at yourself as a global startup from the get-go. And the first thing is, uh, the cost of building a tech company is going down. And I'm not just talking about IT, funny web apps and so forth. Uh, my background is in biotechnology, uh, which is a very capital int intensive uh, uh, industry. But really, uh, hardware as well, everything is getting cheaper in terms of how you build out a company. I put Amazon's logo up there because those of you that are tech entrepreneurs will know that AWS, Amazon Web Services, dramatically cut the cost that you need to have in order to scale out your first iteration of your product. So that also leads us to the rise of accelerators. Uh, you basically just need less money today than you did even five years ago. 
uh, because you would have to rent servers and so forth. And I think that's really, really important because it is democratizing access to technology. Uh, it's a great thing for the world, but it also means that you're now competing against absolutely everyone else. You do not need Silicon Valley or the VCs in Canada in order to necessarily be a global uh, player in the tech world. And the second thing that's kind of related to that is that it's also becoming easier. There are so many tools out there that means that us as founders and entrepreneurs, we can keep our uh, attention to what really matters. We don't have to worry about uh, lawyers, accounting, um, how, how to get your advertising out there. There's so many uh, services, systems, sites, uh, and uh, indeed in, in uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley where, where I live, there's a service and an app for absolutely everything. There are competing apps that'll deliver a certain type of vegan lunches for my team every day. Uh, and like there, this is everything you need, there's some sort of service for. And that's also a good thing, because that means we can now concentrate on building our business and not necessarily on all the trouble of starting a company. Um, there are cultural barriers that are broken down. So I'm an engineer by training. I'm also Northern European, so very similarly to, to most Canadians, uh, I'm used to asking for permission first. Uh, <laughs> five years in the valley will teach you uh, that that not, not, is not always a good idea. But there are a lot of other countries out there where the barriers to starting a company are just much larger than we have in Canada or we have in Europe or we have in the US. And those cultural barriers are also being broken down very, very fast. I put uh, Startup Weekend up there. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. I love Startup Weekend. Um, there, th there's another organization for, for those of us that don't read Arabic fluently. Perhaps we need the translation services. Where did you go? Uh, but, uh, but this is the Global Entrepreneurship Week logo. That happens in 140 countries around the world. They're doing one week a year, it's in November, they're doing all sorts of activities for entrepreneurs. Uh, and there's a lot of countries where there isn't a lot of other types of activities. So that's also changing. And then finally, uh, or not finally, but very importantly, the speed by which we get these products and these companies out, also changing. I put Instagram's logo up there just as like a symbolic example. It took two years to go from an idea to a billion dollar exit to Facebook. Um, and of course, there are, there are a lot of other more substantial projects that will take longer, but it's really important to understand that we don't have time to wait uh, uh, as, as much as we did maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago. So as a result, the fifth thing I put out there was that startups today are fundamentally born global. Whether you like it or not, you are going to be competing against absolutely everyone. So what that leads to is you're, we're being flooded with startups, with apps, with uh, global opportunities, services, and even hardware these days uh, are, are, are increasingly global with 3D printers and, and accelerators and so forth. So uh, it's important uh, to not be caught in the does this work, and I know one of the other speakers uh, spoke to this earlier, it's not just about does this work in Waterloo, does it work in Ontario, does it work in, in Canada, that you are from the get-go uh, competing against everyone else, so you need to be sure you know what's going on out there. Um, and again, I think this is largely a good thing. It's just something that's super important to be aware of when you start off uh, your new ventures, when you evaluate, is it really worth it for me to do this? Do I care enough about this? Make sure that you're looking way beyond what you have here uh, on campus. But there's another trend that really we haven't talked very much about during these two days uh, that, that I, I think is, is a potentially huge opportunity for all the startups out there. And that's the trend of corporations and their need to reinvent themselves. So many of you have probably seen a, a, a chart similar to this. I, I just got it off of a, a very uh, easy Google search. There are tons of them out there. Uh, but corporations used to take about 100 years to go through the process of finding some business opportunity, started in some shop somewhere, uh, a rule, would grow and would uh, many of them get to an almost m uh, monopoly uh, state. So they get so arrogant because they know they are the big provider and they know they have all the capital, have all the distribution networks, they have everything going for them, that eventually they lose track of what happens out there. Some startup or some competing product at some point will come and will just do it better or cheaper or faster than they were already doing. And they don't see it until it's way too late. So while that's a, a problem for corporation, uh, corporations, that indeed is the reason why many of you startups are able to disrupt the markets they're in, I would argue that it's also a huge opportunity. If you understand which corporations are, at, w at which point they are in this, in this uh, life cycle, and you're able to talk to them, you can tap into their huge networks of 
distribution power, of cash in the bank, of branding, of endorsement, and even of funding, and they could actually be your final acquisition uh, of your company, thereby giving you a, a much needed exit. Because if you look back at, at kind of why don't we have enough venture capital in Canada and so forth, a lot of it is related to, well, we don't produce the big exits. So we need to get the corporations to uh, talk to the startups, and that happens almost never. It, it, they talk to them when they're ready to be acquired. So there is an opportunity out there if you understand how to get in touch with those corporations and which corporations are right for you, uh, that can make or break your startup. And you may not even need the, the type of venture funding that otherwise would have, have gotten you there, but typically they go hand in hand. Um, so I come from the world of uh, competitions. Let me tell you a little bit about that before I, I, I move on. How many of you have ever, have ever been in a startup competition? an entrepreneurship competition, a pitch competition, anything where you are, had a deadline and you were, you were presenting in order to, get to win something. Just show of hands. There's about maybe a quarter, a fifth or a quarter of you. It's a super common model. We see it everywhere. It happens in uh, corporations, it happens in uh, universities especially. Uh, governments do it, they're nonprofits, it's a very common format. And what usually happens is what I try to draw up here, which is an entrepreneur will pitch to a panel of judges, whether virtual or in person. Those judges will evaluate you and will give you feedback in most cases. So they'll try to tell you, well, here's either why you won or why you didn't win, here's, you know, help you move forward. Uh, but they'll also collect scores. They'll, they'll, you know, in order to figure out if they have hundreds of applicants, they, they need to use a very, very standardized pattern of how they evaluate the startups. So for us, this is an opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, it happens everywhere. Here are some examples of, of where we have been involved with competitions, and we typically don't run them ourselves. We just power others that are hosting competitions. Um, they are global by nature. So competitions are fundamentally, everyone is equal in a competition. There is no, it doesn't matter who you know, it doesn't matter what background you have or what gender you have, everyone in the competition are evaluated in the same terms. So what we see is that there's a huge participation from the rest of the global startup revolution. Everyone else now wants to be a part of this. And this, by the way, is not our map of competitions. This is one of 400 competitions run on our platform and uh, the about 5,000 applications that, that this particular competition got. So it's a super fascinating data flow to be looking at to try to understand what is happening across the world in terms of new uh, startups. Unfortunately, I can't share all of that with you today because uh, it, it's it, it, mostly these competitions are confidential. You know, when you run at a university, you, you, you're kind of somewhat afraid of your IP and so forth. So we do need to keep them absolutely confidential. But we did just publish a, a report that's, uh, uh, that's free. It's out there called the YN1K of the top thousand startups we found last year across the world. Uh, and, and if you're interested in the makeup of this ecosystem, I, I, I definitely recommend it. But it's important to understand that it is, it's not to you know, soon be global. It is already global, and there is already global competition uh, uh, around this. So we think uh, competitions are, uh, s could be an opportunity to help you as startups get ahead of, of the pack. If you have millions of startups out there, uh, global from the get-go, it's really hard to stand out. It's really hard to actually make it. So we, we saw that there was a, a, a pattern in how competitions are evaluated that could lead to the key of how can we make some of those introductions? How can we make some of those connections that allow you to move on to the, to the next uh, step? So if we put together what you pitched to the judges with what the judges advised in terms of kind of their qualitative evaluation of you, and we put that together with the, the, the judges' aggregate quantitative evaluation. Across all the competitions, across the entire world, we're able to spot patterns of, for instance, saying we can shortlist the top 50 startups within wearables or within uh, a certain geography or within a certain uh, type of founders or whatever it is that, that you're looking for. We're able to spot them and we're able to make those introductions because it now carries trust. This is not just some crazy algorithm. This is the aggregate human judgment of over 10,000 locally uh, appointed judges that are invited in by each university or by each government or by each corporation to say, we trust your judgment. You need to help us evaluate who wins these uh, competitions. So we're able to open doors to entrepreneurs for free. No, one, no startups pay anything for this, but we're able to give you those opportunities because we are now looking at it tr in a truly global fashion. Uh, so back to the corporations. 
that's an opportunity because the corporations will now listen to us when we introduce you. So there is a way that you can use this uh, to your advantage. So uh, I, I would warmly recommend for those of you that haven't been in competitions already, uh, that, that you enter because it might actually be able to open up some opportunities and they're usually free and they usually have cash prices. Um, I already mentioned some of the, the opportunities that they bring, but just to give you a little bit more uh, context, uh, I, I lined up a couple of examples uh, up here. I think mostly I want to tell you about Startup Chile, just because I had some questions about that earlier. Um, how many of you have heard of Startup Chile, by the way, before Howard mentioned it? All right, there, there, there are a few of you. So Startup Chile is an initiative by the Chilean government. They give you $40,000. Uh, no strings attached, no equity, and the only requirement is you have to travel to Chile to stay for at least six months and build your business. You don't have to incorporate in Chile, you don't have to stay in Chile, but you have to go there. Uh, it's a very, very popular program. They, they have done it for three years now. They have uh, handed out almost a thousand grants of $40,000. So it's a very ambitious and thereby also very expensive uh, program for, for a Latin American government. But it's working really, really well. So they have seen, uh, they see about 5,000 people a year apply to these programs. So the acceptance rate to get into Startup Chile is similar to get into undergraduate at Stanford. It's extremely competitive. They've seen about 80 different uh, nationalities apply and people even apply from Silicon Valley to go to Chile because they want that opportunity. Uh, and I, I, I'm kind of singling it out because it is one of those few government initiatives that has really uh, worked. And I have a, a blog post that I'm happy to share to those who are interested. I don't want to bore you with all the details, uh, but, but there are few and far between. But another one I want to mention is Verizon. Uh, they just opened a new competition that's globally available. It's not just in the US. There's $5 million in cash prices. No strings attached. No, no uh, equity needed, right? They are in four different categories. They're in education, they're in sustainability, they're in transportation, and they're in healthcare. So if you're building stuff in those uh, fields, and this is the beauty of competitions, you don't have to invent something for Verizon. You just have to apply and show that you're building something really cool, and you have a chance of, of running away with a million dollars and a lot of uh, PR and coverage for them. So there are tons of these out there that, that, uh, that I can definitely recommend if you think you have something that really is fundamentally different. And let's face it, most entrepreneurs do think that we have the greatest thing in the world. It's kind of a, a necessity in order to, to make it. So I, I, I want to end it with a little bit more about this, the thought of the revolution, because I believe that it goes much further than just the fact that the startup world is now global. I mean, that's great. It's good and bad. It means we have to be a little more global in the beginning. But I actually believe that, that it, it plays into the existing corporations and it plays into government as well to an extent where we'll see startups take over more and more operations for these, for, for let's start with corporations. It's not just about who is the next startup to be acquired. No, they start taking over innovation processes. So corporations do open innovation. They go out and they source uh, ideas from, from startups. But they also start taking over other parts of the corporations. We have requests from companies that ask us about marketing about sales, about getting into a new geographical market. Do we have any startups that are already there? Because they don't have to invest in a new unit that does that. So I think we'll see corporations will continue to be large brands, national brands or global brands. But the operations, the parts of corporations that make that happen will increasingly be dealt with by smaller entities and some of those will be startups. So the startup career choice is going from being kind of a niche thing that most engineers or scientists don't really want to talk about that they're actually doing that instead of their studies or their, their research to I think it's going to be much more commonplace and a much more uh, uh, normal and, and a way to grow your company uh, and your thoughts and your academic background uh, in the time to come. And I even think it'll happen in, in government as well. The government is going to fundamentally shrink and outsource more and more of, of what happens in government to startups. So I think it's going to be an exciting couple of decades ahead of us. Uh, and I think there's much more to it than the, than the global part of it. So I think I'll leave it at that. There's going to be a panel afterwards. Uh, this was kind of a warm-up act for, for that. So maybe let's save any questions for the panel, right? So over to you, Jim. Thank you. Appreciate it.